Ladies and gentlemen, tonight it's really a big, big pleasure because I have Rebecca Brown together with me. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's a great pleasure from my side to have you on, on this podcast and to start discussing about, about diversity and inclusion. But before we start deep diving in this extremely important topic, we would like to learn a bit more about you. And therefore, the first usual question, could you please introduce yourself, Rebecca? Yeah, absolutely. So hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I co-founded ThinkWow, a sales and customer experience consultancy with my husband and business partner in 2019. Um, since that time, we have worked with businesses like Save the Children, um, HubSpot, and we've had a fantastic time. We've, we've loved every minute of it, getting to know the rest of the customer experience community, um, winning some awards for some of our clients in, in the CX Awards, and UK Business Awards. Um, so that's basically me. I'm also a mum of two smallish children getting bigger every day. <laughs> uh, got a dog and two cats. So, yeah. I think this is what you're saying is really interesting. And sorry, I need to ask this question. How is it possible that you can also work together with your husband? <laughs> Do you know what? I think it's it can't be for everybody. Um, but for those who it works well for, it's a fantastic thing. Um, for us, it's even brought us closer together because I think we always had respect for each other professionally. But actually getting to see each other in action day in, day out, getting to see each other handle really difficult situations, but really well, um, it just brings us closer together and we really enjoy it. I couldn't wish for a better business partner, really, because he thinks the way I think. He has just the right amount of customer respect in him, um, which is rare in a sales leader, which is effectively what his background is. Um, but he's always approached sales from a relationship building perspective, which is why he's always done so well in his career. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's not for everyone. And you know, in the first six months, I would say we definitely had our teething issues, getting used to communicating in a business way as opposed to on a personal level. Definitely leaving um, work at the office was a challenge until we got an office. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. now we can just close the door on the office when we leave at the end of the day. And that makes a big difference. It would be extremely unpolite. And therefore, I will not ask who is the boss. Therefore, <laughs> let's stop here with this question. <laughs> and I think in, in 20 years, then you have two additional, additional employees, it are your children, and they're at the complete family work for the same purpose. Yeah, do you know what? I would love that. I have no idea what our kids will end up being, but if they wanted to join the family business, I'd be fully up for that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And you already mentioned family and you mentioned already respect. And therefore, my question would be, which values drives you in life? Yeah, I think family is right up there for us. Um, one of the reasons that we founded Think Well was because we wanted to change the face of the UK customer experience, but we wanted to do it um, to our own set of values. Um, and I think being able to balance that work-life family balance was really important to us. So, yeah, I think family and um, empathy comes really high up on the list, and that's pretty handy in customer experience as well. So it works works well together. Um, and then I think we've got sort of a separate set of values for the business um, that we believe passionately in ourselves, but potentially don't transfer too much into our personal lives, which are to add value, to put the customer first and to make it as easy as possible. Um, and I think, you know, by working through all of those values from the very beginning, we've been able to create a really clear brand identity um, and we've become known for those things, which is is really nice. It's exactly what we were hoping for. Um, and we didn't even dare to dream that it would happen as quickly as it has. I would say not only known, but also extremely successful. And therefore, congratulations for what you are doing. And I think the sky is the only limit that, that you have. And oh, I hope you. also for you that that will work re really well. Now we know you, the player of today, of this uh, game a bit better. And now we can start the game. Uh, today we are playing on the playing field, um, diversity and inclusion. And perhaps before we start deep diving, it's right, it's correct, who is doing good and, and not. What's your view? What's your understanding of diversity and inclusion in customer experience? Yeah, I think that's a really good place to start, because I think the one thing I would want to be really clear on is that I'm not a diversity and inclusion expert. I am a diversity and inclusion enthusiast. Um, I'm a customer experience expert, and I, I fundamentally believe that 
customer experience should have diversity and inclusion at its core. Um, but that's actually something that I've only really recently come to as a belief. Um, I think it's, you know, there's the, the age old saying, you don't know what you don't know until you find out you didn't know it. Um, and actually, as someone who believes passionately in equality and feels very much that my whole life I've worked to support um, various different minority groups is actually only since working with our client Save the Children recently and having a dedicated diversity and inclusion expert in the customer experience project that it really opened my eyes to just how much I still don't know. Um, so I think you know it's a crucial factor for every single business and I think every single business should be proactively looking to build diversity and inclusion in. Um, but I would like to just caveat the fact that all of my answers today will be sort of my personal opinion and my personal experience, not the the kind of verbatim from an expert in DNI. <laughs> I think this is this is what we need. It's passionate people and not the, the the best expert possible that knows everything but i think this is something that we should discuss and we sh should act on and this is also linked on on my next question i don't want also to be unpolite but a lot of people in the customer experience community are speaking about customer experience you should do this you should do that you should try this and you should tr uh, try that but nobody's really acting the doing is uh, doing the doing and therefore my question is in diversity and inclusion in customer experience it, it's even more complicated but I know that a lot of people are speaking about it. W what's your view? People are only speaking about that or are, are also applying the lesson that we can learn from diversity and inclusion? Mm, I think that's a really tough question. And I think it varies massively from industry to industry. Some industries are much, much further ahead with diversity and inclusion. Um, certainly sort of, you know, government sectors, charitable sectors, it's been a very core focus for a lot longer within some of those industries. And so therefore, I think you can start to see some of these tangible changes. But I think like with anything, it takes time to actually see the fruits of your labor. So it may well be that lots more organizations are really prioritizing DNI. But it takes time to actually see that because what you can't do is say, right, that's it. We want more representation from the BAME community in our organization. Therefore, we're going to fire 50 percent of our organization and rehire. It doesn't work that way. You have to slowly progress these things over time. It has to feel sort of deliberate, but organic as well, in my opinion. Um, so I think that there's definitely a lot of really good intent um, and certainly from the people that we've worked alongside who are talking about DNI. There are some significant um, strategies going on behind the scenes. There are some real plans of action to help make those plans a reality. And what we also find is that there are some organizations who it's not even on their radar for yet. So I think that's probably where the biggest work has to, to be put in is to sort of say that this isn't just something for large organizations. This is something you can build in from the very beginning of your journey. Um, and I can say that very easily <laughs> sat here as a team of two both of us are white, both of us are British, you know, the only diversity we really have is the fact that I'm a woman and he's a man. <laughs> but what we do know is that as we grow, think, wow, we will be doing it with um, a very firm eye on DNI. And we're lucky now that through our customer experience work, we, we know some really talented diversity and inclusion specialists who we can consult, who we can work closely with to make sure that we create the right policies, the right processes, and that we make sure that everything's as inclusive as possible. Thank you. I think what, what you're saying, it totally makes sense. And the, the maturity of this topic, it's, it's still developing. Mm -hmm. Perhaps to make that really clear to me, but also to, 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 to my audience, to our audience, is what is the value added of diversity and inclusion? Mm -hmm. And perhaps to make it even more complicated <laughs> and to challenge you, I think also from the two different aspects, internally in the company, the customer experience team, but also then thinking about our customers. Mm. Yeah, and actually, I think I would probably push it out further and say there are probably three aspects. It's within the customer experience team, it's within our customers, but I think there's also um, the internal customer experience for um, your colleagues to consider. And when I when I talk about that, I think it's it's important to explain what I mean by that because I'm not talking about employee experience. Employee experience applies to everybody in the organization. It's something very much driven from the top down. 
internal customer experience applies when you have an element of the organization, a department that exists to serve the rest of the business, for example, an HR function or an IT service. So it's a very different relationship and they have SLAs internally that they've got to stick to. And I think it's really important to build d into internal services like that, even more so perhaps than the external customer. Um, the value add, I think, the, the naive part of me likes to say, well, it's just the right thing to do. You know, why wouldn't we create a diverse and inclusive organization? It feels good for everybody. Everybody feels safe. It feels like a, a pleasant place to work. Um, but I, I know that that isn't necessarily enough for all organizations. They need to see the, the business case, um, which, you know, hopefully we'll move away from in the future. But I think there have been some significant research into the increased creativity that can arise when you have a diverse workforce, um, increased empathy, um, you know, and that's that's crucial for a customer experience function. Um, you often read of customer experiences that are designed exclusively for women by men um, or vice versa. And that, that feels problematic um, at a glance. It's not impossible. You know, we we obviously design services for children and those can't be designed by children. <laughs> so we, you know, there, there's a there's a degree where you have to say you have to just try and understand your users' needs. And that's obviously where customer experience and user experience are are really important. But I think for me, you can't have a truly happy, truly productive workforce if there are any issues with diversity and inclusion. The reason I say that is because not only will you not naturally get that increased creativity, that increased empathy, but actually, if you haven't deliberately approached a DNI policy, my opinion, and as I say, this is my opinion as a layperson, not as an expert, is that you will naturally have hired some people who are um, a, of a sort of a minority group, whether that's a disability, whether it's um, their background, their culture. And if you haven't deliberately catered for those people, it can feel like you've almost deliberately not catered for them. And that's when people start to feel a bit left out. That's when they feel like it's not a safe space for them to talk about any reasonable adjustments they might need. Um, and that can be a scary, it can be a scary thing to even think about. Um, you know, alongside being a woman, I also suffer from endometriosis, which until very recently was not something that would be considered a disability. So it felt very dangerous to bring that up with a potential um, employer during the recruitment stage in case it was something that was a bit of a red flag. I wouldn't get much further. Um, and so I, I always felt conflicted. Do I tell them at this point? Do I not? I don't want to be deceitful, but equally, I don't want to not get the job. Um, and I think that that's just a very small example of how not deliberately building in DNI to everything you're doing within your organization, within your teams, within your organization, and then within your customer research as well, it can have a massive impact. First of all, thank you very much also for sharing a personal story because this make, make, make it really real and understandable for, for the audience and for, for, for everybody. I think what you're saying, is, it's extremely important. And you said that it's important also to prove the value of diversity and inclusion in the two different categories that, that you mentioned. And therefore, the, the, the question that I would ask, who is really the owner of diversity and inclusion in, in a company, in a business and in customer experience? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, my gut feeling, having been through the journey I've been through personally in the last sort of year and, you know, the, the multiple education points that have come up is that really the owner needs to be a DNI expert. Um, not every business will be able to afford to have a full-time DNI expert, but there are some fantastic contractors out there who you can consult with. Um, and I think, you know, it needs to be championed by almost everybody within the organization, a bit like with customer experience. You can't move that great big hurdle all on your own. You need everybody to be on board with it, but you also need someone whose dedicated focus it is to not have to consider anything else because it's very, very easy to start off with fantastic intentions, but to be almost blindsided by, you know, if you're working with personas, for example, in customer experience, there's a huge amount of value that can come from working with personas. It can really help to bring that customer to life. It can help you demonstrate a story. But what if that persona is just 
not taking into account any diversity and inclusion, it could absolutely distract a customer experience team from making sure that what they're developing isn't just a one size fits all sort of delivered to the masses. It's actually something that will remove any barriers, remove any hurdles and be a truly inclusive service. Um, so yeah, I think it's as much as possible, I would recommend consulting with someone who really knows their subject inside and out and hasn't had to be distracted by anything else, um, but to work collaboratively as a sort of cross-functional project group, I suppose. Okay. And uh, I think what, what you're saying is it's at the end, we need the expert for these topics that can help and and uh, and improve that. And if you're speaking about improvement, then we, we come on to the topic measurement. And you mentioned that that you are perhaps not the, the best expert in this topic, but as based on the fact that it's your passion, do you have ideas how we could measure the, the improvement uh, in, in this area? Yeah, and I think um, so. A, a lot of this has kind of come from working collaboratively with a DNI expert. So I'm quite confident to say, you know, whilst these aren't necessarily my original ideas, they are absolutely ways of working that we will take forward within Think Wow. Um, and I think one of the first things I would say is that if you are wanting to build DNI into customer experience, then there's no better place to start than by having inclusion and diversity as a design principle for what you're working on. And those can sit alongside other design principles like making it easy, um, making it intuitive, inspiring confidence, whatever you want your design principles to be. But essentially, if you are journey mapping and you have mapped out every single step of your journey, you maybe have the corresponding internal process to, to map it against, and then you're starting to look at that emotional sentiment. If you have diversity and inclusion as a design principle with some really strong sense check questions that help you really test yourself and push and challenge yourself as a project team, then you can apply those sense check questions to every single step of that customer journey. And I'm talking about things like, are there any unnecessary barriers at this point that could prevent this part of the process from being inclusive? Um, have we potentially applied any of our own bias at this stage? Are we working from data or are we working from assumptions? Um, and it's it's really just about being really scrupulous with it and leaving no stone unturned. And that's the point of customer journey mapping anyway, isn't it? To dive down into that detail, stop leaving everything to chance and to make sure that you can pinpoint where there are problems. This may well be something that helps pinpoint that maybe there isn't a customer pain point, but maybe there is a problem with, with inclusion. So it does open up another element. It does open up another consideration you have to factor in. And that's why I think having permanent representation of someone who is championing DNI on the team is really important because they can help make sure that that project stays on track. But then really it's about looking at, well, okay, what are your, what are your organization's wider DNI goals? And are we as a CX function helping to achieve those goals? whether that's increased retention of staff with disabilities, whether it's actually just recruiting more people in who maybe have reasonable adjustments, whatever those targets are, it's really important to align the CX project with those wider organizational goals. And that's the same for every, for every department really. So essentially it shouldn't really be treated any differently to how you would be liaising with key stakeholders from, from any organization. It's just, I think it's a very important factor and one that needs a little bit more um, deliberate thinking about. I, I think what you're saying, it's, it's, it's really interesting because you're at the end, it's one additional principle that you can apply to different disciplines. It's in the employee experience, it's in the human resources, it's in customer experience. And perhaps as a customer, do you have a good example that you say this, this is nowadays best in practice in diversity and in integration? Yeah, I mean, I think it it is difficult to say this is this is now the the example because obviously every industry has different customers, they have different needs, different expectations. But I think for me, there are some really sort of simple basics that you can apply. Certainly, when it comes to a digital customer journey, for example, um, you know, checking to see well, actually, is our website friendly for people who are colorblind. Um, I think it's something like 12, one in one in every 12 men in the UK is colorblind. And I had no idea it was as high as that. But actually, if, you, if your main brand colors are red and green, and they're on top of each other, are you actually, you know, is your is your website even readable? Maybe not. Um, the same goes, I think, for actually the language and the terminology that you're using on your website. 
the average reading age in the UK is 11, which sounds much worse than it is. I think the, the maximum reading age only goes up to 13 or something. So even if you can read every word, you're, that's your reading age. So it's not, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds. But when you look at a lot of the websites out there, specifically um, within certain industries, you'll find a huge amount of industry terminology, really long-winded explanations for things that could be said in a much simpler way. Um, and actually, I think you can start by just turning your website into plain English, making it as simple and easily accessible for people as you possibly can. Um, it's little tweaks like that um, that should apply to every organization. Obviously there will be other things that could apply to specific individual organizations. And that's where I would really recommend working with a specialist. You are making me laugh because uh, my preferred, preferred language is legal English. <laughs> and you don't understand anything, but you need to agree on that and sign. And therefore I can really understand uh, what, what you are saying. <laughs> Perhaps on uh, one question, how is it possible to contribute or how can I contribute to um, D&I on a daily basis? You know, it, it's a really, really tough one. Um, and I've definitely fallen foul of this in my own life, it, of actually sort of wanting to help, but almost being afraid to put my hand up and say, I don't really know this topic very well. Um, it feels like everybody should already know all of the right answers for DNI. They should know all the right terminologies. They should know all of the right protected characteristics. Everything should already be there. So I think there's a lot of shame around the fact that we're just not there yet. Um, and certainly I have had to challenge myself hugely to, to, to be able to say, look, I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Could someone educate me on this? Um, and that's the first thing I think that we could all do is to actually just admit that we don't know it all. Um, and that's, you know, that's actually not that bad, is it? Let's face it. No one can know everything about everything. <laughs> there will always be areas that we need to increase our knowledge on. Um, and I think if we can be really open-minded to the fact that we do need to increase our knowledge on diversity and inclusion and how we can build it into our processes and our organizations, that's the first step. I think the second step is to stop ourselves from being defensive when we get it wrong, because we will get it wrong. No matter how hard we try and consult with the right people, no matter how hard we think we are aiming with the right, the best intentions, there will be things that we assume we understand that we just don't understand. Um, and I think that it's really important that if someone then says well hang on a minute you've got this wrong you've offended me um or actually what you're saying could potentially be inflammatory that won't feel nice it will feel awful no one likes getting negative feedback but it's really important we just say oh my goodness i'm sorry please tell me how i could do it better next time um and you know that's a tough one in itself because actually i've heard arguments that it isn't the job of a minority to educate the the majority um, but equally, you know, where do we start in that case? So I think lots of self-education is important, but trying to find reliable sources um, and just, yeah, I guess generally that open mindedness to the fact that we don't yet know everything. We won't ever know everything, but that if we are all open to seeing that this is a priority and that we do need to prioritize learning, I think that will hopefully help to start moving things in a, in a slightly more um you know, fast paced progress, which would be nice to see. Thank you very much. I, I think I really love what, what you are saying. And also thanks for all these hints that you are giving us to be sure to, to not to forget diversity and inclusion. I think now we are coming to an end of the discussion, but I still have one important question to ask you during this game. And if we close our eyes, we are in 10 years from now, and we're speaking about customer experience. And I think based on what we discussed until now related to diversity and inclusion, what you're speaking about. Hmm. Do you know, it's, it's a really tough one, isn't it? But I think actually for me, um, I suppose it's a slightly unorthodox look at diversity and inclusion, but for me, what I would hope to see in 10 years time is that customer experience is accessible to everybody, whether or not it's a large business or a small business. We are working really hard at ThinkWow to try and make sure that our services can be accessed by smaller businesses and that for those who can't even afford to have the basic services, that we give away as much information free as possible so that we can hopefully help upskill and educate. But I think there's still definitely a barrier. Customer experience teams tend to exist in the much bigger organizations, and it's very much a battleground of the kind of giant 
giant firms. I would love it if it could be made more accessible, if more customer experience professionals would speak in plain English to real business people. I think that would be fantastic too. There are lots out there who do it um, and some of them are some of my favorite people. Um, But I think you do still occasionally stumble across a professional who uses a lot of that terminology and that industry jargon. And it's because they, they know their stuff, they're experts. But I think sometimes we forget that you know, a modern business owner hasn't learned the same things we have about customer experience. So if we start talking about journey mapping, that might not mean as much to them as it does to us. I think what you are saying is extremely important. And that's what we are speaking about also business cases and so on. You are speaking to a CFO and you're speaking about journey mapping and all this stuff and say, where are the numbers? Show me the figures, <laughs> prove the case and, and then come back. And this is was really interesting. I was speaking with a um, super senior guy in finance a uh, few weeks ago, and he said, "I really like your videos. I enjoy looking, at, but I don't understand you." <laughs> I, I it, it means I I feel that what you are saying it's important, but I am a CFO. Show me the data and yeah. speak my language. And therefore, mm-hmm. what you are saying it's reinforce what what i learned last some weeks ago from from this uh, senior guy thank you very much for your time we are coming to the in the last three four minutes of the game and i would like that you score again some outstanding goals as you did earlier and um, <laughs> the first question is there a book that you would suggest to the audience that help you during your career or during your life yeah absolutely and um, this is one of my favorite books and uh, i don't know whether you can all see it there uh oops get the right angle there um but essentially it it isn't a customer experience book it is more of a relationships book but it applies so much to customer experience it applies to complaint handling to any conversations you have with stakeholders it's all about crucial conversations it's about dealing with conflict spotting the warning signs of conflict before it kind of grows um but yeah so it's called crucial conversations um tools for talking when stakes are high uh, and it's by patterson grenny mcmillan and switzler um that's quite the mouthful but yeah i'd recommend it to anybody in business um, regardless of what what position you fill it's a really useful really useful book thank you very much and uh, if somebody would like to contact you what's the best way uh, LinkedIn is the best way, really. Yeah. Um, if you just connect with me over on LinkedIn, um, probably the easiest way to find me is through Think Wow, because there are loads of Rebecca Browns out there. <laughs> um, but feel free to message me on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll get back to you. Thank you very much. And now we are coming to the last question. Is Rebecca Golden Nugget, it's something that we discussed or something new that you would like to leave to the audience? Yeah, I think um, for me, one of the biggest lessons in customer experience that applies to just about every business is to just understand that most issues in your customer journey happen when something happens that your customer wasn't expecting or when something doesn't happen that they were expecting. So if you can try and really clearly understand your customer expectations, the chances are that you'll be able to reduce the friction within the customer journey quite quickly. Thank you very much. An outstanding golden nugget. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for your time and for this great discussion. No problem. Thanks for having me on. It was a great pleasure. Rebecca, please stay with me. And to the audience, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. If you have any feedback or you would like to contact Rebecca, please do that because I think we are a great community and we can learn from everybody, from everywhere and from everybody And I think this is really an an extremely important topic that we discussed today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the word of mouth. Subscribe it. Share it. Until the next episode, please don't forget, we are not in a B2B or B2C business. We are in a human-to-human environment. Thank you.